Wednesday morning. It is OTBM and it's 8.34 and uh, we're turning to something wholesome. Uh, it's hurling and James Scale is with us this morning. James, good morning to you. How are you? Hi, Joe. How are you? How are you? Um, Arthur James O'Dea wrote a brilliant piece at the weekend talking about your battle for the number one jersey in uh, Galway hurling over the best part of a decade. And it just had loads of details in it that I, I never heard and never knew and never fully understood exactly the, the level that um, yourself and your colleague slash rival went to to get the number one jersey um, and so we just thought it would be good to tease it out and just live a little bit of the experience with you um, wh- sure. when you got into the Galway setup, how long did it take you to become the established number one what age were you um, I I, I sort of nine called me in his first year in like October or six so I was just out of mine and we temporarily beat us in the final in September yeah and so I went in 06 and started training away and we did all the doggery training, you know, terrible training that's kind of synonymous now with looking at his tenure in Galway. But um, so basically when I first got in rightly, my first year was only kind of a, you know, a bedding in period, you could say, you know what I mean? And then I really got, I got the jersey in 2008, so I would have been 20, 20 when I, when I got it. And then Colum came in in 07 as well, uh, the kind of the last stage of 07. He was the goalie in 07. And I had never known Colum, didn't know he existed. And then he came in and thought, Jesus, who, who's this lad? Like, do you know I mean? pretty good, do you know what I mean? And then we just started a contestant from there on. So I'd say from, from really and truly from 2008 onwards when the, the battle started. Are you roughly the same age? No, I'm 33. Colum is about 30... Oh, God, I hope I get this right. 38. Right. 39. So, <laughs> He's going to shoot me. Now. <laughs> nearly, <laughs> nearly 40. You may as well. Late, late 30s. You get away yeah, with that these up, days. Sure. Up, yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, and, and so... Because we've talked to you before about like you know stuff came easy to you early, and so uh, did you just expect to be number one when you got the number one? It was like this is going to be fine. What was that like? What was that experience? Yeah, yeah. You see, I have to go back. You have to understand. Like, I, I came from a position whereby, like, and this is this is a part of wh- who I was back then. You know what I mean? Not now, obviously, but who I was back then. So, you know, a couple of Ireland's at sixteen, minor goalie both years, twenty-one goalie for three. So, so like in my age. I was like unanimously the best goalie in Galway. Do you know what I mean? At that age, I thought in, in my head at that, at that time, I said, and then I'm going to roll into the senior team, and it's just going to be a continuation of same. That's that's what that's where my mindset was back then. And then when you get into the senior panel and things don't start to go the way you go, you expect them to go. In the first year, I think, Jesus, I have to kind of fix my mindset a small bit here. And that took me a full year of kind of, <clears throat> I suppose, like I said, betting in, like to get come to terms with it, you know. And then when I got the jersey in 2008, I had some up and down performances that could. In fairness to Jordan, he stuck with me and had a pretty pretty good year. You know what I mean? So that was that was an amazing experience. He said, of a kid, for, I think it was anyway, at twenty to uh, to kind of start to nail down a jersey in his first in his first real year, you could say. And when did you lose it? Um, I lost it in in two thousand nine, and <clears throat> it was kind of a culmination of things, you could say. Two thousand nine was a pretty shit year, to, to excuse my language, but uh, I broke my hand uh, in like May, the day before my final year exams in college. So my hand was broke. Then I came back from a broken hand and then my father passed away. And then when he passed away, that just triggered a whole series of shit. Do you know what I mean? Like just bad mindset, bad mentality, bad person. Do you know what I mean? Bad player. I said that in the, in the article with Arthur that, that I didn't really come around from that until realistically speaking, like May of 11. You know, and that's, I only got to 11. <clears throat> I only got to, <clears throat> excuse me, after that two years, let's say from kind of May of 2009, to May 11, I only kind of got back to where I was in the year previous, you know what I mean, no age, you get me? Yeah, yeah. And, but, but then, like, from 11 onwards, I was still in a bad spot. So I still wasn't performing, I still wasn't the, the best player I could be. I wasn't putting myself in the position to be the best player I could be, you know what I mean, until like 12, and then that kind of kicked on a bit more better. Two years of, of very intense grief, it, it sounds like, and, and I, you know, I think everybody deals with grief differently, and, and it never really goes away. I, I think that's kind of... What makes human beings so strong is that we we always remember, and and that's why humanity continues to uh, exist. It, it seems to me, like, um, yeah. how what 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 happened two years later that allowed you somehow to be free from the biggest of the burden that you carried? Um, I, well, I wouldn't say I was free. I just I, I would say that I accepted it happened, and you know, time does heal an awful lot. I say, well, I wasn't healed fully. Don't get me wrong. I'd never be healed fully, and anyone who loses a person of of such love, let's say, will never, they'll never be healed rightly. They just kind of come to terms with it and, and keep moving on with their own lives, you could say. So come 11, and 
it was really, I had, I had a conversation with Jamie Joyce. I've often mentioned him, like I say, and you know, he's one of my best friends, but in terms of, of setting me on a path, right? I just had a very, very frank conversation with him. And what he had with me, should I say, I, he did most of the talk and I just, I had to listen, you could say. And he kind of, it was more of a monkey see, monkey do, I had to do when I, what I see him doing is what I said, right, I'm just going to consciously try and make an effort to make, to make the best effort I can to copy what he's doing, you know? And like still at the age of uh, 41, that man is still, you know, he's in supreme shape and still plays for our club. So like he was a great example to follow. But I stopped doing what I was doing. So and I'll be honest, sir, I was drinking alcohol during the year, say, when I shouldn't have been. You know, um, I was doing things that were completely uncharacteristic of me. Uh, I had bad discipline issues. I was just basically a prick for the two years. Let's be honest, right? And and kind of when I spoke to Damien, he just kind of set me on a path. And then that was 2011. I had a good enough season in terms of my form, which kind of led me into 2020. 2012, which Anthony Cunningham took over, and I had an interview with every every kind of senior player had an interview with Anthony and Tom Helbert and Matty Kinney, and they fairly agreed me on what had happened the two years before, which then kind of kind of forewarned me that I can't do it again. You could say, which set me into a year of 2012, and that was when Anthony, Matty, and Tom really they really backed me up and told me not to worry about Anthony. Essentially, and that set me on the road. Then it's amazing how much influence. A, a proper conversation can have like um, you know Damien having that conversation with you Maddie Kenny seems to from the piece also had quite a, an important role and yeah. it, like again th- I think this is all just about grief isn't it like you know you were a prick for two years but very understandably yeah. given what you were carrying yeah uh, well understanding was one thing it's just I look back now obviously I'm coming from a, a position of seniority now looking back to, to a young fella and you know it was I think it was my own and I, you had to understand the different time back then my own sort of masculinity was getting in the way that I, I can't be asking for assistance here. Like, you know, if I ask for assistance, it's going to be looking like I'm asking for help. And if I need help, the management aren't going to trust me. If they don't trust me, I won't play. So all that triggered a series of thoughts in your head, right? You have to carry this yourself, carry the burden yourself. We had no sports psychology back then to a certain extent. They were, they were well, sorry, no psychology. We had a sports psychologist, right, who could talk to you about sports, but no a grief counsellor. Do you know what I mean? A life coach. They weren't there back, back they're, they're there now. So if, if it all happened again, if God forbid, if, if, if a family member or a player passed away now, I think there's great structures in most counties um, to kind of facilitate that process. You know, back then there wasn't. And I, I suppose to come back, I made a whole host of mistake in not saying anything, uh, carrying the burden myself, and being an asshole to people, thinking it was acceptable, you know. And only then, Jaycee put me on, kind of gave me, and again, it was a frank conversation. And when you hear it coming from one of your best friends, it really cuts you deep, I mean, in the right way. In the right way, not not he wasn't being you know facetious or like he was just giving me straight between the eyes what what uh, what he thought had gone on the last couple of years, which was a major pillar for me to go forward. You know, do you remember what he said to you specifically? I remember where I was exactly. I remember the time it was, and we're outside a community centre in Capsagel, and he called me down, and it's, it was regular for him to call me down at that time because I was he was such a it was a vast age gap, <laughs> so we weren't exactly best friends back then, but we've grown to be best friends. Like but he told me that um, the effect I was having on people in the club, uh, the effect I was having on my mother, um, because he, his father passed away at a very young age. He was only like four or five, so he saw the difficulty his mother had in raising a family throughout, <clears throat> throughout his life. And now, obviously, we were effectively raised, you know, so it was a different situation. But he told me that what she was going through was 10 times worse than what I was going through, and just to cop myself on. And it's not all about you, essentially. And uh, before you know it, your career is going to be gone. And you have the talents and you have the fruits to do it. But right now, you're the only one holding you back is yourself. So, uh, you put up or you shut up. You know, simple as that. And that was a real hammer blow, you could say, it, to mm. get. But it was the best thing that happened. Yeah. The best thing that happened. You know? did, like, and he you... was captain of Galway at the time as well, just to coincide with that. Mm. Like, do you remember how you felt when he gives that to you between both eyes at, at that exact moment? Yeah, I do, yeah. I felt um, like for the first direction was, oh, he's wrong. There's no way I'm, you know, it's a pure denial. You know what I mean? And the only way you move forward is, is through acceptance. And when I went home and digested it, you know, it only took me a day to digest it. I, you know, he's right. He's actually right. Because when you go through all the series of, of events that went on two years prior or whatever, and you start to look really deeply and honestly, you know, who was at fault? I always it was pointing at myself. You know what I mean? And like, I'd say people in my own club team hated me, you know, because I was always given out, always on their case. But the wrong things, you know what I mean? Uh, I'd say my mother was happy to get me out of the house at 21. You know what I mean? When I, was, when I left, which is quite young to move out. Grant was going to college to move out, but I moved out fully at 21. You know, I haven't been home since. But she, I said that was tough and hard for the, for the, and I say this in the comments, for the man of the house then to leave, you know what I mean? 
Um, but I think it was necessity because I just had to get away from all that. And they, they had to get away from me too, to be honest. You know what I mean? Because it was toxic and it was, it was me that was at fault, to be honest. Which is hard to say now, but it's the truth, you know? Hard to work through. Uh, like, look, uh, yeah. you know, we obviously have sympathy now with the character you're describing because you're talking to us from this remove but like you know we, we've all yeah. seen people who are in the midst of that rage that you must have felt with the alongside the grief and and we can understand how toxic how easy it is for one person to to make everything around them toxic the, the recovery period from your own perspective when you look back how how quickly do you become more mature and how quickly do you start accepting that you need to be a better teammate and a better son and a, a better brother and all that kind of stuff yeah, well, I think full level of maturity and acceptance didn't really hit me until I'm going to say, honestly, nine, the year 2019 or 2020. That sounds like it's, it, and that was years apart. That's full, in my view, that's full maturity. I think from like 2011 up to 28 was, or well, 2018, excuse me, was gradual. You know what I mean? Whereby you stop, like you, like so me and my mother now have the, have the best relationship possible. And I suppose everyone around the place, Thinks I'm a mammy's boy, and I have no problem saying that. <laughs> I am, I don't mind that. But like, you know, like we have a fantastic relationship. Me and my sisters have a fantastic relationship. You know, all my cousins, we all have, everyone, great friends in the club, let's say. And so that had to that had to grow over the course. Obviously, it started with family first. That they're, they're the most important people to to mature with and understand. You were wrong, and and fix that. And then it became outside life, let's say. And when you go out, let's say, on a social event, to hold yourself rightly. And then, you know, in work, hold yourself in a in a in a high position that that. Warrants your position at work, you know what I mean, and so on and so forth. So I'm going to say it took me eight years, you know, with, uh, and with talking to various people as well. I, like I used various people to help me uh, in the line, line of psychologists and and people who had gone through similar experiences. Like so, without those those conversations, you know what I mean, and I suppose those that time I wouldn't, you know, I'd still be in a similar position to where I, I was years ago. So I'm going to say right now I'm I've accepted. You know what I mean, <laughs> and it's just. I have kind of rectified what it was back then. What does that maturity look like in 2018, 2019? Like, how have you changed? Um, I think, so, I, I, I'm, I, I'm, I, can, I can be quite excitable at times. I, I, that's, that's the PG version of saying it. Whereas that, that would translate to I have a bit of a temper, okay? Um, that, that's genetic. That's not, I'm going to pass that on to my, my, <laughs> my father, his side, right? But, whereas right now, in, take example as, in a club game, right? If someone passed a comment to me a few years back, I would automatically see red and straight away I'd want to get them back. Do you know what I mean? And then I do my team harm and then you go, oh, damn it, I should have done that. Whereas in nowadays I say if I can anyone can send them to me, it doesn't matter because I just know it's about the team. My performance is one fifteenth of the team and like I'm not bigger than the team. So I don't have to I set my personal, you know, agenda aside. I want to win. And if I win, we all win. If we all win, I win. So it's kind of maturity not to be Listen to the BS on the pitch or off the pitch, believing it and trying to go after them. Do you know what I mean? Or even if you have a conversation with a family member, and they might say something about your performance that you didn't like, or you know, and you just accept it. Whereas in years years ago, if they said about performance, I'd nearly hold a grudge against them for a week. You know, do you know what I mean? Or if, if they commented on positively on on a on a, on a rival, do you know, a rival goalkeeper, I'd be saying they're against me now. Do you know what I mean? I wouldn't talk to them for a couple of days. Do you know what I mean? That was the that was the mindset. It's, it's terribly hard to. To articulate and to understand where where was I back then? Whereas now it's like, you know, you just deal with things better. You deal with situations better, whether it's on the pitch, off the pitch. You deal with people way better, you know. And you just grow as a person. That's it. And like especially then, what really happened then was when you have children. So when my firstborn came along, Sophie, that was a real, you know, you're very fallible. Like so, you, you're you're not just representing yourself now. You have to take care of this person, you know. So it's on you. So put all your own shit aside and look after this as well. That's really what was the trigger of all the the. The maturity, if you like. The the importance of hurling in all of this is actually primary to, to everything. It's like, uh, and that really comes across very well in Arthur's piece, which I, I can't recommend enough that people go and, and read. But the fact that Damien Joyce was the, the captain of the Galway hurlers and that your life's ambition was to be the number one in Galway and that was yeah. now, now at risk all of a sudden because of your behaviour, it sounds like that was also very important in kind of just waking you up a little bit. It was, yeah. Like, and throughout all that, see, even the hurlers, the guys, whether they're my own age or years years above me, they were excellent to me. You know what I mean? Like I still hold them all. I still hold them all very close to me in the, in the, in the sense that what they 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 too put up with shit. You know what I mean? And and they brought me along as the lads. You know what I mean? And Colin was huge in that. You know, like I don't think he would have 
people would ask me like how how, you, how did you get on with Colum so well or how, how are you not why why didn't you dislike him because you're rivals and first and foremost he's a, he's a great dude like, he's a great person he's a friend of mine so put Hurland aside that for a second and yes Hurland introduced us don't get me wrong but like we're kind of really two compassionate people I'd say you know, he's, and he's hilarious like so he's great to be around you know what I mean he's kind of infectious so like first and foremost he's a friend and like when you're a friend with someone you only want the best of them and vice versa that's why our relationship was so good you know what I mean and it was important for him like for me to have him do you know what I mean and I'd be honest about it when he retired in in 19 like it just even though he was a coach it still wasn't the same do you know what I mean <laughs> which you know it's not, it's not the same and I was only talking to a player recently and he, a senior player he was talking about a couple of retirements and he was saying it's not the same the dressing room isn't the same when you lose yes you're in, you're in, a, you're in a, a high intense environment which you're looking for success but when you lose a couple of people who you your class is really good friends you know it's, it's difficult to overcome and then you're your why, as I put in, in one of our commas, kind of subsides a bit. You know what I mean? So, yeah. like, that's why when, when Colin retired, yes, he was a coach. It just, you know, it, it began, you know, it's not the same anymore. Do you know what I mean? Yeah, totally. I might be explain that well, but yeah. You, you want to yeah. enjoy the whole. The, one of the reasons that you stay committed to it is because you actually in, enjoy. You get off a little bit on the suffering and the sacrifice and the pain. Like that's kind yeah. of, uh, and you enjoy that part. But you, you also have to enjoy the the downtime because otherwise it just becomes yeah. a chore. And it, th there was right. one other really um, uh, strong piece that, like, your this is a hobby. Why don't you just give it up? Stop banging on about the sacrifices. That kind of there was that that whole oh these poor intercounty players. That there was a strain particularly in the mid-teens there where it was like people were criticising the commitment of the inter-county players as one of the things that was driving the arms race and the constant refrain was why don't you just walk away you should give it up it's only a hobby yeah yeah and like you know I think I had a debate with a person a few years years ago not a debate it was a conversation to me about the, you know the GPA grants that are being offered to players you know and 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 she was saying she that, that essentially that was a, it was ridiculous and there were people who needed that money far more and you know, I, look, you can contest the GPA grants all you want, right? My belief is that, that the GA players should be should be semi-professional and they should be adequately expensed, you know what I mean? Or, or I'm not going to say paid, but expensed for what they bring to the game. So that's my belief, right? But in terms of uh, the, the, the most simplistic approach, and it normally happens on Twitter, right, that you'll get on people who would engage you and say, just give up the game, sure, if that's difficult, why? And they're from people who the vast majority wouldn't have played a game at that level at all, i say. So the, the, the understanding, they're not coming from a position of understanding. So I'm not going to comment on something unless I've either went through it or I understand it, because then I'm misinformed. So you'll never see me commenting on cricket. Do you know what I mean? I have no idea what's going on. So like, I can, but I'm in a great position to comment on inter-county GEA, because I've done it for 14 years. And so yes, it's a game and we love to play, and it's fantastic for, for winning and for, you know, big crowds, etc. But you must understand that probably, probably two thirds of GEA players will never experience a, more, will never experience a full pro park, will never experience an Ireland win, They'll never experience a provincial win, you know. They'll never experience a homecoming. All these things. So you're, then you ask yourself, why are GA players playing the game? And it's much deeper than success or, or participation. It's your community, like do you know what I mean. So I, my neighbour up the road, 93 years of age, and he he gets so wound up, let's say, to see us win in club games that it's like it's like he's playing with us. Do you know what I mean? And it was the same go back through my career. Say if I didn't play with Galway, I wouldn't be letting down. I'd be letting down myself. But I've letting down so many people in Catch Eagle, you know, who actually take great pride on saying we've got a country player from a club historically that wouldn't have no senior titles, wouldn't have been senior for 95% of their, their time. So it would be very difficult for me to get in a position of prominence in a Galway team and then to give it up when I know I'm representing something much deeper than myself. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I, I think people people fail to understand that, which I can I can side with because they haven't gone through it. So that but, for me for me, James, that's the external part. The internal part is that the other the other part of this is that hurling is in you. That like it's a oh, yeah. the public manifestation and the community is very important, but actually it is your identity. Absolutely. And I, I, someone said to me, Justin Campbell before when he gave us the talk, he said that you know, when you walk into a into a, any public place and say you're always wearing a jersey, you know, that's fine. That's okay. But it's bred into me. It's genetic. It's hereditary. It's put into me as a child. So it's like it's. I wouldn't call it a drug. I, I just call it. It's, it was a calling. Do you know what I mean? I, there was never going to be a situation where I wasn't going to be a hurler. And that that was put into me through family. All my uncles played. My mother was a good player. So do you know what I mean? If I imagine if I left the guy and what my mother do to me. Do you know what I mean? Like, <laughs> like, but um, it's bred into me. It's in my blood. Do you know what I mean? And that's and it's easy. And I can give you all the lovely snippets here and all the lovely you know sound notes of, of what, it, what it means but it's just in 
your soul as a person. You know what I mean? Every player that's playing, it's it's brave into them and they're not going to deny it. Do you know what I mean? And, and that, it's, it's for those who understand it and then really make it grow as ones that are good, you know? And that's why, it, for me, reading the piece, it felt like it was such an important part of, of your recovery because we haven't spoken about this. You, you blamed yourself for your dad's death. Yeah, I did. And I, and then I, I, and I know like, the easy thing is people turn around and they say, oh, what in your fault? Like, you, you weren't flipping there. You know what I mean, like, I was there and I can remember the exact position in the field I was when I said, when I said, right, we're going to the doctor. And he said, no, I'm, I'm fine. And me being naive and young, believed him saying, that's fine. But, but when I look back now, the symptoms he was showing, he was, it was obvious the, the clock was ticking. And it was ticking down the way, you know what I mean? But and I said, geez, if I just caught him, and now he was strong. So like, me catching him was never going to be an issue. But you know what I mean? If I just coaxed him a bit better or put a bit more effort, he'd be still alive. So that kind of way. And that's what I carried for a long time. And my mother and uncle say, what in your fault? What in your fault? That's fine. You can say that to me, right? But in reality, in my head, it was. You know what I mean? And it's only again, as you go through the, number, the years, I, I really asked you the day before that I accepted it. it wasn't. There was very little I could have done, you know, because <clears throat> he was in a much more senior position than me, a much more mature position. So he should have flipped and done the right thing and go to the hospital. You know what I mean? So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I accepted that. You know, I accepted that. And that was, you know, eventually. That was important. That was important to do, you know. I, I'm sure, I'm sure, because otherwise it, you'd, you'd never feel at peace. But it, it seems, James, from. And like the in, the intertwining of your identity as a hurler and, and who you come from and the genetic makeup and that conversation you just had, I think it's clear as well though that you've learned lessons from hurling that you're applying to life of like okay. needing help from outside uh, and asking for help and you talked about your own masculinity getting in the way you getting you stepping outside of that and going actually I do need help. Yeah, yeah, I I, I agree with you wholeheartedly and even I use. My, my professional life, let's say, in, in a contract manager with Kerry, as I say, and then in my, 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 my call it social life in terms of hurling, they're so intertwined in, in that the, the attributes you need, the attributes, excuse me, you need and the mentality you need are very, very similar in terms of needing, like people, it's all people, you need people and people need you and it's the relations and how you, you build those relations and not tarnish them or break them, doesn't mean, and in order to build relations, you have to have a good health mentality and you have to have open eyes, doesn't mean, and it's not all about you, etc. So that, those two are very intertwined. Hurling has taught me an awful, an awful lot of how to be a professional in terms of my professional career. And I don't think, <clears throat> I honestly don't think if I didn't have the hurling or sport in general, I wouldn't be where I am professionally at the moment. I'd say that would be 10 years later. So it's kind of expedited my career uh, indirectly, if you know what I mean. And how do you so think... It's just so important. How do you think you'll, ha you'll handle the progression of life when club hurling isn't a thing anymore or sport isn't a part of your life anymore? Yeah, I I, always, I I think I'll always have an involvement yeah. in sport or something. Like that. I just need I I, I need I, I I know I personally need to be always looking forward. I can't be looking back. It's not good for me. This is I need to be looking forward to the next game, next training session. And at, at present, it's it's about me preparing myself to play. You know, whereas I think as the years go on, it'll be about me preparing myself to coach or to manage or to you know to fundraise or something like that. Do you know what I mean? Where I'll, I'll always have a focus that'll be centered around sport. And I I would pretty much. Bet it's going to be in Holland, obviously. I don't know this word, but one, one, two, three. Okay. So, like, it's it's going to be it's going to be a tricky one for me, but I, I'm going to stay involved in sport somewhere. So, it'll be, I'm hoping for it to be an easy transition, but we'll, we'll wait and see. The, just. Um, like I mean, the piece is absolutely sensational. It comes highly recommended. Just one of the other things that um, came out from the piece. Well, one of the things that I didn't really know from the piece was um, uh, Arthur spoke to, to Christy O'Connor about uh, a certain drill he had done with Colm Callan, which was initially reported by Dennis Walsh in the Sunday Times. Uh, in Christie's own words, he said he absolutely reddened him. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, the, I, we all know that goalkeepers are absolutely mad, James, but I, I presume you've been put under the pump quite a bit with, with similar drills. Oh, reddened, that's nice way of putting it. You know, <laughs> saying reddened. Like, you know, like when you first tug out and it's cold, you want to get your hands going. Doesn't mean you don't want the ball coming at you and you have to catch it every time. And he used to do it every day, hit the ball so hard and the pain in your hand. But as the session go on, like, and he had, he had the most unorthodox drills that you'd ever do but they were they were so applicable like we had a drill one time whereby he was coming down with polythene a roll of polythene you know and and, and fairy liquid and Colm and I looked at each other and we're going where is he going with polythene and fairy liquid <laughs> so and we, he goes right lads he said the weekend is promised wet so he said what I'm trying to replicate now was skinny ground right fine so he put down the polythene in front of us okay and he squirted fairy liquid all across it and then he started hitting the ball off the polythene sheet 
And could we help save it? Because it was bouncing, just skidding this way, skidding that way. But I just thought the ingenuity of it, yeah. I never would have thought of it anyway. Do you know what I mean? But, and, and it's funny, like, and they were, they're great experiences just to picture him. I can see the picture of him coming down with a roll of quality, wondering what in the name of God has he got next. Do you know what I mean? But he kept it fresh. He had doing drills all the time. That's why it was so enjoyable. He's a genius at some level. There's a, there's a, yeah. a strain of madness and just the quality of work, the body of work that he's put yeah. together over as a, as a writer over the last uh, two decades now is absolutely sensational stuff. We, we, yeah. we have to let you go. We haven't even talked, Henry. We'll get you back on soon enough to talk about that. But James, I think, sure. honestly, like uh, Ireland has for such a long time hidden in secrets and pain and we don't talk about these things and for you to talk openly the way you did with Arthur and again today is a testimony mm-hmm. to you and to your family and and uh, and the people that you come from so thanks a million for sharing that with us thanks for having me on I James great stuff thanks James Keller um, with that story and if you want to read more there's a, a, a long piece that you should get your hands on by Arthur and uh, Arthur James O'Dee you can get it on otbsports.com it is bang on 9 o'clock this morning OTBAM live with Gillette proud sponsors of Movember gentlemen let's mow